Harvard. He's a prolific author and is now conducting research on the challenges of building community in an increasingly diverse society. As you know, City Club's mission is to inform its members and the community in public matters and to arouse in them a realization of the obligations of citizenship. In Better Together, Dr. Putnam includes a chapter on Portland entitled Portland, a Positive Epidemic of Civic Engagement. We at City Club like to think that we educate, incubate, germinate, and support many of the causes of the epidemic. We look forward to hearing his comments on how we cantankerous Portlanders appear to buck the national trends. Dr. Putnam. Thank you very much. It's terrific to be here in Portland. For anybody um, uh, who studies civic engagement, uh, coming to Portland is like coming to Jerusalem. So I'm really delighted to, to be here. Um, Here's what I'd like to do in the, uh, the time that we have available. <clears throat> I'd like to ask, by, by the way, I, I apologize. Somehow uh, in, in uh, uh, my declining years, I acquired a case of asthma earlier this week. And I'm now, for the first time, I'm now uh, dealing with that. And I hope you'll forgive me if my voice sounds a little, <clears throat> my voice sounds a little strange. The four questions I'd like to ask are, first of all, um, what's been happening to civic engagement? Connections, social connections, people, connections to your family and friends and neighborhoods and community organizations and, you know, the city and government and state and politics and so on. What's been happening to all that in America over the course of the last century and more specifically over the course of the last 30 or 40 years? And the answer to that, just to give it away, the answer to that is going to be that by many, many, many different measures, I'll share some of them with you, the trends have been down. Um, and. That will pose the question, the second question that I want to ask, which is, how did that happen? It's not been happening for actually most of the uh, 20th century. Indeed, for most of the 20th century, we were becoming more and more connected with one another. And then suddenly we began to become less connected. So that'll pose an interesting question. And at that point, I want to ask your, your advice about what might have caused that. Um, the, the second uh, question that I want to ask, is, the second question is, how did that happen? And the third question that I want to ask is, well, so what? I mean, who cares if we're connecting or not connecting with one another? I mean, it's maybe worrying about whether we're connecting or not connecting is kind of a nostalgia for a 1950s that we really, in fact, if we, if we thought about it, wouldn't want to return to. And I will want to argue, no, no, it actually matters a lot to the state of our communities and actually to our own physical health, whether we're connected or not. And that will lead naturally to the fourth question that I want to ask, which is, well, what do we do about it then? And at that point, I will come to Portland. And I promise you, I will get to Portland. But for most of the time, I'm going to be, at the beginning, I'm going to be talking not just about Portland, uh, but about the, the country as a whole. And that's my plan. But in my day job, uh, I am a professor. And I thought you might not believe that unless I began with just a few minutes of social theory. And so I want to just say a word or two about social theory. I promise it won't be long. And I just want to introduce one concept. And I think that'll be then be helpful to us as we have the rest of our discussion. The concept I want to introduce is the concept of social capital, social capital. You all know what physical capital is? Physical capital is simply some tool, like a screwdriver, that makes you more productive than you would be if you didn't have it. About 25 years ago, economists taught us to talk about human capital to refer to training and education. So just as we can invest in a screwdriver, we could also invest in you know, a, a, a education, I mean, an automobile mechanic school. Or we could get a college degree, and that would make us more productive too. And those of us who are working on the field of social capital are saying, yes, there are features of our communities that are like that too. You, the same you, with the same physical tools and the same training and education, if you have the good fortune to work in an organization or to live in a community where people are connected with one another productively, you can get more done than if you had the misfortune to live in a community or to work in an organization where you, people, you couldn't count on people to, to help pitch in and help out. The core idea of social capital is very simple, very simple. Social networks have value. Social networks have value to the people who are in those networks. Lots of examples of that. We talk about networking as a career strategy for 
you know, getting ahead, and that, that's true, actually. I mean, does it make sense? Because, in fact, most research says that most people in this room, most people in America, including me, get their jobs more through whom they know than through what they know. I'm not talking about um, nepotism. I'm just talking about you hear about a job that's open or somebody who's looking for a job says, have you thought about Jane? She might be good for this job. Those sorts of social networks are good for us. Um, and they, they, help us, they help us out in, in terms of material benefits. There are many other examples of the way in which I'm going to talk about some of those other ways in which our networks are helpful to us. But the more interesting thing is that social networks sometimes have value for bystanders, not just the people who are in the network, but the bystanders. A lot of examples of that. One that I'm conscious of actually right now is that that comes from the fact that criminologists, people who study crime, have taught us that um, the best predictor of a low crime rate in a neighborhood is how many neighbors know one another's first name. That is, it's, if you, you know, you keep, keep people keep an eye out if they connect with one another. I happen to live in a, for many years, lived in a uh, suburb of Boston called Lexington, Massachusetts. We lived in a neighborhood with a whole lot of social capital, um, all the time people having picnics and barbecues and, and sledding parties and so on. Do you know what sledding uh, party? <laughs> I, I thought you might. Um, and, um, and I'm able to be here right now, confident that that house in that neighborhood is being protected by all of that social capital. Even though, and this is now the moment for confession, I actually never go to any of the picnics and uh, barbecues and sledding parties. I'm not proud of that fact, but I, I'm able to benefit from the network even though I didn't take part in it. And of course, if you've had Economics 101, you know that what I've just finished saying is that, economic, uh, that networks have externalities, that is, their effects on bystanders of being in networks. And again, there are going to be lots of examples of that that I'm going to mention here. One reason why networks, social networks have these remarkable features, almost miraculous features, is that it turns out that in a community or in an organization where people are connected with one another in productive ways, what tends to evolve is a norm of reciprocity. Reciprocity sounds like a highfalutin term. It just means I'll do this for you now without expecting something back immediately from you because down the road she'll do something for me and you'll do something for her or you'll do something for him and he'll do something for her and anyhow we'll all see each other at choir practice on, on Thursday. I, I know that reciprocity already sounds um, pretty, pretty uh, compl complicated. It was actually best uh, explained by a, a philosopher from New York City uh, that some of you will have uh, heard of. His uh, name is Yogi uh, Berra. And Yogi said, if you don't go to someone's funeral, they won't come to yours. <laughs> Actually, it's a deep thought. The longer you, longer you think about that, the deeper that thought becomes. Um, Yogi captured the idea of reciprocity and captured the core of social capital, social networks. And that's the end of the academic lecture. So what I've just told you is it makes sense to worry about connections, networks in a community. And I'm going to call that social capital. Um, now, suppose I ask you, think, to think about some community that you know well. It may be Portland because you've lived here, or maybe you have spent a lot of time in some other community. And I ask you to tell me, what have been the trends in social capital in that community over the last 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 years? How would you know? I mean, you could ask, you know, grandma or something to ask what the trends are like, but, you know, nostalgia and memories are imperfect, and so maybe we've... And anyhow, what I do for a living is to count things. So suppose I said, what could you count that would tell you about trends up or down in social capital? And if you thought about that very long, I'm sure you would think, it would occur to you, as it occurred to me, well, lots of the social capital in a community is involved in organizations, embodied in organizations. Organizations involve networks among people, and, and organizations keep membership records. That's an important thing. And we can look at membership records, trends in various membership in various community organizations over a long period of time and see whether they were up or down. And now we wouldn't want to know just how many members of the PTA there were, we, because when there's a baby boom, there are going to be more parents, and more parents being more members of the PTA. But what we want, really want to know is what business people call market share of all the parents in the of all the people who could have belonged to the PTA, of all the parents in America, year by year, over the course of the 20th century, how many of them belonged to the PTA? Of all the kids in America, year by year, how many belonged to the Scouts? Of all the Jewish women in America, year by year, how many belonged to Hadassah? Of all the Catholic men in America, year by year, how many belonged to the Knights of Columbus? Of all the doctors, how many belonged to the AMA? Of all the 
um, middle-aged men, how many belong to um, one of the animal uh, clubs? No, 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 that's a, that <clears throat> that's a technical term. Uh, it, it refers to the fact that all men's organizations in America are named for animals, the Lions Club and the Moose Club and the Elks Club and the Eagles Club and so on. So we gathered data on these trends and all these organizations, the, the, you know, the PTAs and the, and the animal clubs and the scouts and the 4-H and so on. And we added them all up and looked at it for the course of the whole 20th, whole 20th century. And if we can have a, the first slide, you'll see what that picture looks like. I hope you can see. I hope we're going to get the first slide. Hello? Well, meanwhile, let me tell you what the slide looks like. If you all, you all look here while they're fixing the slide, I will describe the graph. The 20th century begins here and goes over to 2000 here. Here's about 1950. And the graph sort of goes up like this. Hey, there it is. Just what I was saying. See, up. <laughs> and then there's a little, there's a, there's a big dip. It's, for, for most of the 20th, the first half of the 20th century, the first two-thirds of the 20th century, it's gone up. That big dip, of course, is between 1930 and 1935. Half of all, many organizations in America lost half of their members in the five years between 1930 and 1935. But then coming out of that, <coughs> probably the greatest civic boom in American history um, many organizations in America lost, uh, I mean, many, many organizations, in fact, almost all organizations in America doubled their market share between 1945 and 1965. And then suddenly, silently, mysteriously, all of those organizations began to experience leveling market share and then slumping market share and then plunging market share until by the end of the century, we're back down to depression levels. And I believe that that graph is not a bad summary, actually, of the trends in social capital in the United States over the course of the 20th century. But I know this is a very insightful group, and I know that already several doubts have begun to surface in your mind about whether that graph proves what I just said it proves. First of all, you'd say, well, wait a minute, that's just card-carrying membership. It doesn't say anything about whether anybody actually shows up. Secondly, you'd say, those are all old-fashioned organizations. They've all been around for 100 years. That's how they got into the graph. But maybe those are the old-fashioned organizations. We could call them the funny hat organizations. So maybe the, maybe the funny hat organizations have been gone down, but you know, we've been, there's another whole new set of vibrant organizations, clubs and so on, that are growing up to replace them, new age poetry groups or Alcoholics Anonymous or something. And so maybe we've stopped, we're still joining, but we're not joining that, that those groups. And thirdly, you would say, and you'd be right, Bob, not more than three minutes ago, you just told us that not all social capital is organizational. I mean, cheers, the bar, where everybody knows your name pure social capital. Actually, it isn't. It's a TV show. But if it were a real place, it would be real social capital. So maybe we've stopped going to the Elks Club, or we're going to bars instead. Or maybe we're, you know, having friends over to the house, or maybe we're going on picnics, or who knows. Maybe we're connecting, in other words, lots of social capital, but just not in organizations. Now, I've known for a long time that that was possible, that that could be misleading. My problem was, remember, what I do for a living is to count things. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out where the National Picnic Archive was kept. So I thought, how would you know whether we were going on more or fewer picnics than, than we used to? And then the most exciting thing that's ever, in, at least in my professional life, the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me, I discovered two massive new data archives. And you're saying, this is a little weird. Uh, he gets off on data. And, and that's true, I do. And I, and I would like to get you excited about the data, too. Um, the first of these archives comes from a set of polls that have been done by the Roper Polling Organization every month for the last uh, 30 years and more, um, asking Americans a lot about their civic activities. Um, actually, let me ask you these questions, because you'll, you'll get the point. Think about the last 12 months. Have you any, let me see the hands of all those who, in the last 12 months, have been to any public meeting where people talked about local affairs. Let me see your hands if you've been. Whoa. Whoa. OK. I'm OK. Put your hands down. Um, you're a little weird, too, actually. Um, I, will explain, I'll give you, I will give you the statistical evidence in a minute for what, the, the fact that you're a little weird. Um, OK, next question. Um, uh, have you, let me, if, let me see your hands, have you been in the course of the last 12 months, um, have you been a, either an officer or a committee member 
of any local organization. Let me see your hands. Okay, now I am intimidated. Um, I realize I am in Portland and at the City Club. And I'll, okay, so don't raise your hands. I will just tell you the other questions. Um, uh, have you, in the course of the last 12 months, uh, signed a petition? No, no, keep your hands up. Um, have you, in the course of the last 12 months, uh, run for office? Now, not that many Americans run for office, but this is a humongously large survey. Half million, half million Americans ask these questions over, over, over 30 or 40 years. So we can get good long-run estimates of really quite rare behavior like running for office. And I could summarize the results of that archive very simply. Every, if we have the next slide, every single form of, of activity that mentioned, every one of the 12 has declined. This is the one that, you at, that we ask, I ask you, attendance at public meetings. Um, in 19, these are nationwide data, not, not um, uh, just Portland data, not Portland data, actually. Um, but in 1973, 22% of Americans said they'd been to some public meeting in the previous 12 months, and by the, by, by the middle 90s that had continued to fall, it had fallen to, um, to 12%, and it, it, it keeps going down. Um, and I'm not going to show you any of the other pictures because they all look the same. Basically, nationwide, over the course of the last 30 years, in communities all across America, roughly half of the civic infrastructure, I mean public meetings and local organizations and petition signing and so on, half of the civic infrastructure of all of our communities simply evaporated. That's, however, not the most interesting of the two uh, archives that we discovered. We, we also learned by accident that a, a, a commercial marketing firm in Chicago called the DDB uh, Needham Company has been gathering every year a lot of data on consumer preferences. Um, there aren't marketing firms, so they ask people about, you know, Nike or Adidas or Yoplait or Dannon or, or, you know, GM or Ford. Um, but they had the idea that 25 years ago, 30 years ago now, that if you were going to try to write an ad for yogurt, it would help to know something about yogurt, the, the, the market, the target audience, besides the fact they eat yogurt. I mean, are yogurt eaters also swimmers or joggers or divers or hikers or do they pray a lot? Or So they, they began to ask um, questions about the lifestyle of the people in their surveys, and in the course of doing this research, they ask a whole lot of really interesting questions, and they generated what is absolutely one of the most interesting sort, big sources of data about changing American lifestyles and habits and so on that I know of. Um, they ask a lot of questions that had the, fo the following form. Um, how, many how many times last year, they ask, did you go to church, for example? They, they had the idea, which turns out to be true, actually. One, Hallmark is one of their big clients, and they had the idea that churchgoers are more likely to send more greeting cards, which is true. How many, so they ask, how many times last year did you go to a club meeting? Any kind of club meeting. How many times last year did you volunteer? Uh, how many times last year did you um, uh, have friends over to the house? How many times last year uh, did you go on a picnic? I had discovered the National Picnic Archive. And, <laughs> and I can report to you as a matter of certified truth that in 1975, the average American went on five picnics. Last year, the average American went on two picnics. We are in the midst of a little no noticed national picnic crisis. Um, a lot of other questions that they ask, how, you know, how many times last year did you um, go to a dinner party? How many times last year uh, did you give the finger to another driver? How, did you know what I meant by that? Actually, I wasn't sure whether a Portland audience would, uh, would know what I meant by that. I'm way off topic here, but um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the other questions in this survey, um, this is true, actually everything I'm saying is true, but this is also true. One of the, one of the other questions in this survey was, was about tax evasion. And by far, out of the thousands and thousands of questions in this survey, the best predictor of tax evasion is the number of times you gave the finger to another driver. <laughs> I had, actually had a great idea for the IRS uh, about how to, how to identify audits. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm way off topic, I'll get serious here. Um, okay, I can, I can summarize, this was a lot, a lot of questions in this survey, and I can, I can summarize the results. This survey, this set of surveys, 100,000 people, um, very shortly, too. Every single form of social interaction measured in these surveys over the last 30 years has gone down big time. Uh, club meetings are off by about 50%. Now, now we're not just talking about old-fashioned club meetings, any kind of club meetings. Used to be that the average American went, on 12, went to 12 club meetings a year, once a month. Now that's down to about five club, club meetings a year. Most Americans actually don't go to club meetings anymore. 
Um, in fact, the decline in going to club meetings is greater than the decline in club membership, which means that lots of the time, actually, we still carry a card around in our pocket saying we're the member of such and such, but we actually never show up. And that's, that's true nationwide. Um, lots of other examples of this. There's been a, well, actually, there's been a huge decline in dinner parties. The dinner party going has declined by about 60%. That was actually 60%. That was um, comforting to my wife, uh, Rosemary, and me. We've actually not been invited to a dinner party for the last, <laughs> for the last uh, decade. But we're pleased to know that none of you are going on dinner parties either. Um, but OK, OK, dinner parties are actually already sounds a little 50s. But how about just you know, having friends over to the house? That doesn't sound so old-fashioned, does it? I mean, you know, just having people come over to sit by the pool or to play pool or to watch TV or to hang out or something. If we have the next graph, I think that's, um, this is the number of times. This is not, remember, this is not asking people to remember what it used to be like. It's comparing what people now say with what people then said about the average number of times you had people come to your house last year. In 1975, that was 14. And by the, by the end of the century, that was down to about eight. And these graphs get really kind of boring after a while. I mean, they all show basically the same pattern. Uh, going to bars is off by about 35%. Um, uh, I said picnics were off by 60%. Um, every, everything basically is down playing cards. I mean, I'm using these, these examples like this. You see why I'm using these examples, because I'm, let me interrupt myself. If I had started talking, I'm a political scientist by training, and if I started talking to you about voting, the trends in voting actually are very similar. The trends in voting across the 20th century rise to 1964 and then decline. And if I had said to you, if I started off with it, this is a, with a story about voting, you would have said, I understand that, Professor Putnam. Uh, everybody, when they want to be a little critical, they always say, Professor. Um, well, I understand that, <laughs> Professor Putnam. Um, and, uh, and that's about Vietnam and Watergate and scandals and so on, they would have said. And if we looked only at voting, I could believe, actually, that these declines in, 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 in community involvement could be driven by what was happening politically. I mean, you know, we're upset about scandals, and we stop taking part. It's, it's you know, somebody else's business, not ours. It's a little harder for me to imagine that the reason people have stopped going on picnics is that they're still mad at Dick Nixon. And, <laughs> and what I mean by that is it seems to me that this is a much wider than just political change. It's a change in all, like playing cards. I mean, in 1957, there are a few people in the room who will remember, remember 1957. In, in 1957, 40% of all American adults played bridge regularly. Um, you know, you, some of the people remember, you know, your parents were, they had a mixed doubles or game or whatever. 40%, that's now down to about 6%. They're all in retirement communities. Um, if, and, and if you say bridge, to a group of undergraduates at Harvard or any place else, if you say bridge to them, it sounds to them the way whist does to people my age. That's it's, it is, it's a game you've heard of, but you can't imagine any breathing person um, playing it. And that, that there's been a steady, long-run decline in card playing and so on. You see why I'm using these homely examples, I suppose. I'm talking about not just do-gooding. There are lots of other, I want to show you just a few other pictures. If we have the next slide, this is trends in church attendance. Now, it is true nationwide, this is it's very important because nationwide, about um, half of all America's social capital is religious. About half of all of vol volunteering is religious. About half of all uh, philanthropy, about half of all group memberships in America are, are religious. Churches or, or you know, Bible study groups or whatever. So it matters a lot. You know, whether we're not, not whether we believe in God, that's not the issue here. The question is, do you connect with other people in your various communities of faith? And the standard question that's been asked for oh, uh, actually 60 years now, is a question, um, have, did you, asking people, did you in the course of the last seven days attend a religious service? So I'm going to shorthand to say church attendance, but it's of course not, the answers are not just churches or synagogues and temples and so on. Um, and you can see that's what, that's what the graph looks like. Rises from 1940 up to 1960, 65, and then begins to decline. Just about the same time that we stopped going to PTA meetings, we also stop going to church. And that, that same post-war, you see the post-war boom in connectedness and then the long steady decline. Actually, that, that graph probably understates somewhat the total decline in, um, in church attendance because sociologists have recently taken to doing a rather interesting kind of research. They ask people the standard question, did you go to church last week? And then they check to see, were you actually in the pews? <laughs> and there are two interesting findings from this research. You've guessed one of them. The first is, lots of us, lots of us misremember um, whether it really was last week that we were at church. 
twice as many, twice as many people say they were at church last week as actually were in the pews. Um, and secondly, there's some evidence that we are misremembering more than our parents did in response to the same question. So if you do go to church now, there are more phantoms sitting beside you in the pews, that is, people who think they're there but really aren't. Um, and the phantoms are already are also counted in those numbers over there. So if we took the phantoms out, the numbers would go down even more. Um, it's not only in these, all of these kinds of forms of informal and formal networks that, I, that, this is, uh, that you can see these patterns. If you go to the next slide, it's true in terms of even the things closest into us, our having dinner with your own family. Um, the red lines are the people who say, we always, you know, of course we always eat dinner together as a family. The blue lines are people who would say, well, you know, we try to have dinner together. We usually have dinner together as a family. The light blue lines at the bottom are the people who say, well, what do you mean, eat dinner with your family? Um, and that actually, that graph also understates the total decline because um, it's limited to people who have a family with whom, in principle, they could have dinner. And during this same period, there's also been a doubling in the fraction of Americans who live alone, and they're not in the graph. And so if we included that, the decline in family din dinners is in total about, roughly speaking, um, uh, 40 or 50 percent over this period. Uh, can we have the next slide? Uh, you can see the same patterns in many other, uh, many other indicators. I'm not going to bore you very much with more of these, but this is the trends in uh, giving money away, philanthropic generosity. Um, by comparison to other countries, America actually is a generous country. We give away, Americans do, a larger fraction of our income than most countries do. Um, but that's a trend in how we compare to ourselves. And it begins, the data began in 1929, actually, which is when the government began collecting the data. And it, you can see this, it rises, not just absolute dollars, but the fraction of our income that we give away. It rises through the Depression, it rises through the post-war boom, and then just at the same time that we stopped voting so much and going to PTAs and going to church, and so on that same moment, we also stopped giving so much. And there's been a long-term steady slump, not in absolute dollars, which are going up, but in the fraction of our income that we give away. And finally, we trust one another less. If we have the next slide, this is, if you, if you ask Americans in the 1950s or 60s, a very simple question. I mean, just ask yourself this question. Would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can't be too careful? If you ask people that question in the 1950s and 60s, more than half, almost two thirds of Americans said, yeah, most people can be trusted. And now two thirds of Americans say most people cannot be trusted. And the dark blue dots there are actually the answers to the same question among successive high school graduating classes in America. So this is concentrated among young people, not because the young people are, are the cause of the problem, and, and, not, and also not because of some kind of national epidemic of adolescent paranoia. Um, it's because, like the canary in the mine, young people are telling us that they are growing up in a less trustworthy society than, than people older than them did. Um, okay, um, so the answer to the first question is uh, the trend, you all know that now I've given the first question was what's been happening to civic, civic engagement, social capital in America, and uh, you all now know what the story is, up and then down. Um, now you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't he say he had four questions? Um, and we're, that was just, wasn't that just the first question? How are you going to get through this? And I, I, that was the first question, and I'm going to be a little more brisk as we go through the, the next part here. But the next part of the, the second question, which is, why did that happen? How come they looked like that? Actually, can you go to the next? I think the next graph is an ad. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so for a while, you can just look at me and then, or, or glance occasionally over to that, that ad, because we're going to get there. But that that's, tells how to fix the problem. But let's first of all see if we can figure out, how did it happen? How, how come this is not, this is not happening, but ever since we came off the whatever boat brought us here, it's been in the lifetime of most people in this room. It was going the other direction, and now it's going down. I mean, it actually, it turns out that all those graphs start going down the year that I first voted. And that is one possible causal explanation, <laughs> but I thought I would explore others. And you, you know the, the, uh, the murder mystery by Agatha Christie, Murder on the Orient Express? You know the answer to the question there, who done it? is basically everybody done it. And this is a mystery like that. That is, there are multiple culprits. I don't mean everybody done it, but there are multiple culprits. So what I want to do now is ask your participation, what 
are the suspects that I should put into the lineup as possible causes of that. I don't want to have the whole indictment read out. I just want to have you raise your hand and say, I think it was done by Colonel Mustard uh, with a lead pipe in the conservatory, and then we'll keep going to others. Yes, ma'am. Baby boomers caused it. Yes. Longer working hours. Television. TV. Yes. Technology caused it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. The decline of leisure and women entering the workforce. And we have another vote for women entering the workforce here. Yes, ma'am. The GI Bill caused it to go down. Okay. Our families and children are busier earlier. And actually, another related to that, you might say, in the aggregate, we have fewer children. And children actually used to be the way people got connected to their communities, actually. So maybe it might be that. Yes, sir. The flight to the suburbs are two people working. Two people working in the flight to the suburbs, so longer distances. Yes, ma'am. Crime or the fear of crime? Crime or the fear of crime? Right. I mean, earlier on, very early in this talk, I said social capital has the tendency to cause low crime. But also, crime has a tendency to cause low social capital. So there's a kind of a vicious circle, and maybe that somehow is involved. Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, Kennedy assassination. The Kennedy assassination. Right. Yes, ma'am. Vietnam. Vietnam. OK. Dick Nixon actually did it. That's the, that's the answer. Yes. Or Lyndon. It's the media that did it. I actually long suspected that might be true. Uh, yes, ma'am. Popula increasing population density. Um, one last here. Yes, sir. The automobile and sprawl. The automobile and sprawl. That's, that's a, a great suggestion. It's related to the suburbs. I see a, a suggestion over here, ma'am. Rising divorce rate. Rising divorce rate. It, that also sort of looks like it tracks this. Yes. <coughs> Everybody moving around a lot. OK. Maybe because every time we move, we, we lose our roots. Um, I know there are a lot of other great answers, and I, and I, I mean, great suggestions, and I just want to OK, I know. If I don't call on you, you're going to be really upset. So money, money. Less money for a large Stagnant wages. Stagnant wages. OK, good. Um, well, some of the, 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 the and by the, by the way, I should say, I do not know for sure all of the causes. I will say that up front. But I do know that some of the suspects that you have named are innocent. Um, and I want to exculpate them right now. But some that you have named are guilty of sin. And I want to indict them publicly. Um, and then some of them I don't know, so I'm not going to be sure about all of them. Let me begin with a, a suspect that looks very guilty but isn't, and that's mobility, the last thing, mobility that was mentioned here. It is true that we're like repotting plants every time you move us around. We, take, we break off some roots, and it takes time to put down new roots. That is true, but it's not true that we're moving more. American society has become geographically less mobile over the last 50 years. When our parents were joining up a storm, they were moving more often. Uh, than we do. And that's true whether you mean across the country or across the street. There's just geographic mobility has been declining. Um, so that's innocent. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, ur um, uh, urban sprawl, which is actually a, a good idea. It's another kind of movement, but it's a different, uh, different kind of factor that is commuting and so on. I actually had not, did not have that on my list of suspects early on. You, you guys are better at that than I would have guessed, because it turns out that is true. There's a, Actually, a quite simple rule of thumb. Every 10 minutes more of additional commuting time cuts all forms of social connection by 10%. So 10 minutes more commuting time means 10% less church going, 10% fewer public meetings, 10% fewer dinners with your family, and so on. And 20 minutes more means 20% less of all those things. So that's a significant factor. It's not the, mo not the most important, but it is, it is a significant factor. Um, uh, income and, and uh, prosperity, or poverty or, or you know, that sort of economic stuff, I don't think, actually, that that is relevant. And the reason for that, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but I think I want to let that one off free, because the trends are down, actually, similarly among rich folks and poor folks and at all levels in between. And they're down about the same. That is, on average, rich folks have more social capital. That is, they're more likely to be involved in clubs and so on than poor folks. But the trends are down in both those groups. And, and so I am not don't think that's likely to be. And the, and the ups and downs of that cycle don't match the ups and downs of the American economy. It starts going down, actually, in, in, at, the, at the sort of the final years of the, one of the greatest booms in our history in the, through the 50s and 60s. So um, I, I don't think it's so much e economics. Um, 
working women, women working outside the home. Um, my daughter, Lara, uh, is a professional woman um, and a mom, and someone that I'm very close to, actually. Quite, we spend, she's a, also a social scientist. We spend a lot of time talking about stuff. And she tells me that I have to be really careful in the next three sentences so that I don't give you the impression that she personally is responsible for the collapse of American civilization. Um, but it is true for guys my age that our moms were great social capitalists and our wives and our daughters are doing other great things instead and they're only 24 hours in anybody's day and we guys have not picked up the slack. So part of this story is a story of two career families but that's a much smaller part of the story than most people think. Actually, most people, when you talk about it, think that must be the main explanation, but it isn't. And the reason is you can see exactly the same trend among groups in the population that have not been affected by that trend. I mean, among unmarried men, for example, the trends are exactly like that. Among, and the, the drop in PTA membership nationwide is actually greatest among stay-at-home moms. Um, so it's not mainly a story of two career families. That's a little bit of the story. Um, television is another matter. Uh, television actually is a big part of the story. Um, actually, watching public affairs television, watching you know Oregon Public Broadcasting or Jim Lehrer or, or uh, Tom Brokaw or whatever, <coughs> is actually good for your civic health. But most Americans don't watch public affairs. Most Americans watch Friends rather than having uh, <laughs> friends. Um, and. <laughs> and, and, um, and commercial entertainment television uh, is lethal for social connections. I mean, actually, I do not, you don't know me very well, but I actually do not, I'm not a cultural grouch. I don't like being, uh, you know, a, a kind of a Savonarola saying, you know, give up your TV, throw it away, and so on. I don't like that. But the facts, the data are actually very clear that TV is a significant, significant depressant of, of civic engagement. And if you'd like, in the question period, we can talk about what my evidence for that is, because I, I made that as a strong statement, and I'm prepared to give you the kind of evidence that makes me say that. Um, you know, the way a social scientist goes about trying to solve a mystery like this actually is the same way that a, an epidemiologist tries to solve a problem of, um, of an epidemic. You look for hot spots in the population or you look for parts of the population that have been Im immune to the trend. And I spent a lot of time with my research team looking for looking exactly that strategy, looking for places in America that had not been affected by this. And, and that actually it's a, it would, turned out to be a quite fruitless uh, mission because in fact the trends are down everywhere. The trends are down on the west coast and down on the east coast and down in middle America and down in suburbs, down about the same in suburbs and in central cities and in rural areas and in among rich folks and among poor folks and PhDs and high school dropouts and black folks and white folks and men and women and the lines are all going down and just about the same in all those groups. There's only one exception to that generalization. Um, the trends are not down among older people, where older means older than me. Um, <laughs> actually, that's what the word older always means. It means older, <laughs> older than the speaker. And um, what the data show is that um, the group of Americans who uh, came of age before or during World War II, um, it's what Brokaw calls the, the, the greatest generation, what I call the long civic generation, the people born roughly speaking between about 1910 and about 1940, born in those years, um, basically is an amazingly civic generation all their lives. There are a few people of that age, I think, maybe in the room, but most of us are, are younger than that, or, and for some people in the room, it's, that's their grandparents' generation. But that generation, the World War II generation, was statistically really amazing. All their lives, they voted more, they joined more, they trusted more, they schmoozed more, they gave more, they gave more money, they gave more blood, they gave more time. They were, they were joiners when they, when they had kids. PTA, that's just exactly when PTA membership went through the roof. Um, it was an amazing, Terrific generation. They're like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep going forever. And they're, they're still heavily voting, even though many of them are getting on in years, because that's a very civic group. The problem is they did not pass those traits on to their children, the boomers, and on to the, their grandchildren, the, the so-called X generation or the, the millennial generation. And the difference between the grandchildren and the grandparents is enormous. Um, 
it, I want to make clear that the, it's the, the, the grandchild children's generation, it's my, my own kids and my grandchildren, those, they're, they're wonderful people, that really are, but they don't have their grandparents' habits of civic engagement, connection. And much of the total decline in American civic involvement nationwide is simply due to generational arithmetic because every year we lose another slice of the most civically engaged portion of the population and we add another slice of people at the bottom, as I say, wonderful people, but they're not joiners or they're not connectors. And, and, and that disjunction between the, the, what we're losing and what we're, what we're adding uh, has a long tendency. To, we're like a, like a down escalator. We keep, unless, we, unless we do something special, if we have to run really hard just to sort of stay at the same level. Of civic, it's, it's why in most, most parts of this country, in most organizations, the organizations are gradually graying because they're, and it's not because any, every individual organization thinks it must be something they did. And my point is it's not any, it's, this is a nationwide trend. It's not, you can't fix it with a better program chair. This is a, a bigger problem than that. Um, but okay, come on. Third question, who cares? I mean, why Putnam stop hyperventilating about clubs and, you know, the animal clubs and so on. Why are you getting so fixated on this? It, maybe this is just all a matter of nostalgia for a kind of, you know, homophobic and, and racist even kind of 1950s that if we, if we just thought about it, we actually wouldn't want to go there. And there were, of course, serious problems in the 1950s. I mean, I actually knew the 50s, so I know there are serious uh, problems. But concern about social capital, concern about connectedness is not just a matter of nostalgia. There are measurable ways in which these social networks have real value to us. As I indicated before, crime is affected by this. Um, another, another factor is schools. If you were worried about the quality of schools in your community, about how kids were doing, I, I know that wouldn't happen in Portland, but if you, were, if you were worried about test scores, for example, or dropout rates or whatever, um, you might have one of two strategies. You might have, say, let's spend 10% more on the schools to have smaller classes or better teachers or whatever, or let's have 10% more parental involvement in the educational process. Now, there's no question this is the more effective strategy for raising test scores. I'm not saying, I want to make clear, I'm not saying we shouldn't be spending on money on schools. Indeed, my wife is a public school teacher, so I have a vested financial interest in paying teachers well. And, it, and paying teachers well and having smaller classes, and so on, all those things that money pays for is valuable. But what we mostly talk in America uh, talk in America now about a school's problem actually is not a school's problem. It's a parent's problem. It's the fact that the parents have, who are crucial in helping to, to, to being involved in school activities and in the lives of their children, that has, has declined nationwide. I don't mean you personally have dropped out of your kid's school, exactly. But that in, in, in general, there has been that decline in, in connectedness, and that's actually a big part of the educational problem. I won't go, there are a lot of other examples of other parts, other ways in which our communities don't work so well if we're not connected, but I just want to close this third part of the uh, talk uh, very simply, very quickly. There are powerful physical health effects of social connection or its absence. Uh, and here this research is actually pretty strong. Um, controlling for all of the other things that affect your life expectancy. I mean, holding constant your age and your gender and whether you smoke and whether you jog and, and so on. Your chances of dying, actually your chances of dying are high. Um, <laughs> your, <coughs> your, chances, your chances of dying over the next year are cut in half by joining one group. Cut in three quarters by joining two groups. As a statistical risk... As, as, a statistical, as a statistical risk factor for premature death. Social isolation. I don't mean living in a cave someplace. I mean just not knowing your neighbors or not being connected with family and friends and so on. Social isolation is as big a risk factor for death as smoking. If you smoke and belong to no groups, statistically speaking, it's kind of a toss-up. And if you do smoke, by all means, you should join a couple of groups to, uh, to, to make up for that fact. I, I'm, I'm, I want to be careful here. I, I, want, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be practicing medicine without a license. Um, but what I really want to try to say is, and, and the connections here are, 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 are complicated in, in many ways, but the core idea is, is not complicated. Concern about social connection is not just nostalgia. It's a matter of there are measurable effects for our own health 
and for the health of our communities about whether we connect or not. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, well, I, I don't know for sure, but I want to first of all now give you a little bit of a historical framework for thinking about that problem. And then I promise I will get to Portland, because I know I've got to get to Portland before this is over. In a nutshell, what I have said is that over the course of the last half century, roughly 30 or 40 years, a variety of technological and economic and social changes have rendered obsolete a stock of American social capital. That's just jargon for saying two career families and urban sprawl and TV and so on mean we no longer feel comfortable going to the PTA or the Elks Club. Now, go back 100 years with me in a time machine. We get out of the time machine. It's 1904, we're in you know, downtown Portland. You get out of the time machine. Of course, the first thing that you would ask if you got in that situation is how is social capital doing? Um, <laughs> and, and what you would find is that in America at the turn of the century, the same thing was true. America at the turn of the last century had just been through 30 or 40 years of traumatic economic and social change that had rendered obsolete a stock of their social capital, which is uh, jargon in that case for saying the Industrial Revolution and urbanization and immigration meant that when people moved from the village to the city, you know, whether the village was in China or in Italy or in Russia or in Iowa, they left behind a lot of their family and community institutions. Not all of them, but they did lose some in their, in their, that left behind in their, where they'd come from. And they moved to the cities. And, you know, the old-fashioned ways of connecting in the new urban diverse places that they were living just didn't cut it. I mean, barn raisings and quilting bees kind of aren't the way you make friends on the Lower East Side. And, and America, at the turn of the last century, suffered from these symptoms of a social capital deficit that we do today. Uh, high and rising crime rate, a growing, growing gap between rich and poor, the only two times in our history when the gap between rich and poor has widened then and now. Um, th their time felt a lot like our time. They, had, they were actually much better off materially than, the, than their parents had been, and they knew it because they had all these nifty gadgets. They had phones and cars and so on. They felt materially better off, but they felt spiritually, that's where they put it, spiritually disconnected, didn't have a, didn't have a sense of community. And then they fixed it. They fixed the problem. In a very short period of time, 10 or 20 years, most of the major civic institutions in American communities today were invented. The things that we all think God must have invented were not invented by God. They were invented by people like us about 100 years ago. The Red Cross and the Boy Scouts and the League of Women Voters and the NAACP and the Urban League and the Knights of Columbus and the Sons of Italy and the Sons of Norway and Kiwanis and Rotary and, and Lions and, and, and. It's hard to name a major civic institution in American communities today that was not invented in about 20 years at the turn of the last century. Now, if you'd been around then, it would have been tempting to say, indeed some people did say, life was much nicer back on the farm where we all knew each other. Everybody back to the farms, please. But that's not what they did. What they did instead was to invent new ways of connecting that fit the way we have come, they had come to live. Similarly, if you look at all those down charts that I showed you earlier on, you might be tempted to say, indeed, to my horror, some people have thought I was saying, life was much nicer back in the 50s. Would all women please report to the kitchen um, and turn out the, turn out the television, he said in a grouchy, grouchy way. And that's not what I'm saying. You understand? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to, in some sense, reinvent the Boy Scouts. I don't, I'm not talking about that organization. We need to be as creative for our time as they were for their time it won't necessarily be organizations this time around, but we need to have a concentrated period of civic reinvention in our communities all across this country, analogous to the way they did it. Now, it, it won't be easy, but it won't be. It's not like rocket science. They were just like folks like us. It was actually not Harvard professors who solved the problem last time. It was ordinary folks in Peoria and, you know, and, 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 and uh, 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 pardon, in Portland. Yeah. So let me come to Portland. I knew that you wanted me to get to Portland. This new book, which I'm going to be very brief about so we have time for questions. The new book is called Better Together. It is 12 case studies of places across America where people in many different niches have successfully begun to go upstream against the current of disengagement, inventing new forms and ways in which people are reconnecting. And we're going to go through in kind of MTV fashion very quickly a map which will show you our sites and a few pictures, and I'll just give you a, a very quick travelog of some of these sites so you get a sense. Uh, let's go there. If we, first of all, in, in Orange County, California, a very interesting church, Saddleback, conservative ba Baptist church that has grown from 7, 000, from 7 members to 30,000 members over the course of the last 
um, dec uh, 20 years, and it's a very interesting church in which the reality of the church is not the, not the big um, rock bands and so on that you see there, but it's the small groups inside the church, the uh, Geeks for God and the, and the Cis for Cisco certified uh, programmers and the, and the uh, you know, volleyball players for God and so on. And that notion of a cellular church in which people are connected in small groups to a larger church is a really interesting idea. Next place we might want to go is to Tupelo, Mississippi, where Tupelo has had a remarkable re record of 50 years of economic growth based on a community building model. The next place we might, might want to go is uh, Valley Interfaith, Rio Grande Valley, Texan, uh, Mexican migrant farm workers, 20 years ago, incredibly impoverished, not, not just not a whole lot of money, but no indoor plumbing or no paved roads. And by building a network of connections among uh, largely Catholic churches in the area, successfully overturned the Anglo power structure. Next place we want to go is UPS, uh, exemplified by a study in Greensboro. UPS is a very large national corporation. Um, and it's not perfect, but it, they do a remarkable job of using social capital to help the bottom line. This is not just a matter of, of warm, cuddly feelings. Next slot, next place we go is, of all places, Portland, Oregon. Yes. Now, I want to. Here's, here's what I want to show you. I probably can't walk over there. I'm told I have to stay right here. You see the that that's the same graph you saw before. The line going down. That's public meetings. Remember that. What do you suppose the other what line going up is? That's you. That's Portland. So the the same time that the rest of Americans were slumping slowly onto the couch and becoming slugs, somehow in Portland, people were suddenly going to more meetings. And it's not just meetings, actually. Every single measure we have, they all look like that, right? The rest of the country is dropping out. Now, at the beginning, Portland was no different than any other place. Portland actually was slightly less likely, Portlanders were slightly less likely to go to public meetings in 1973 than the average American city. But by the end of that time, you're three or four times, you're really weird. Three, three or four times more likely to go to meetings. So there's something here. And now when I ask Portland friends what to explain that, what could happen, most of the answers they give can't be true. <laughs> I mean, the first thing people say, of course, is it's the weather. <laughs> but unless I'm mistaken, it was actually still raining in 1974. <laughs> so I'm making a serious point here. Anything that was constant over that period can't explain the divergence. So it must be something new that happened in Portland. It can't be the Swedes or whatever. And the second thing is, uh, people say, oh, so when I ask them, they say it was the 60s, right? We had this sort of activism here in the 60s. Actually, you know, the 60s happened everywhere in America. <laughs> and they were sleeping afterwards, and you didn't. So it can't just be the 60s. And, and I don't know for sure the answer to the question. The person who's actually doing the slides there is a man named Steve Johnson, who's at Portland State. And shortly after we, saw, we discovered that graph, I got unsolicited in the email uh, a copy of his uh, of a book that he's written on Portland. It's a terrific book. Steve, stand up so people can see you. Um, it's a uh, Steve and I didn't didn't know each other at all until he randomly sent me by email a copy of his book, and it's a, it's a terrific history of Portland. And I'm not going to try to summarize his book in in uh, in 20 seconds, uh, except to say that it's a very interesting story about a a. Uh, dialectic process. It's not, the, as I now see it, it's not that everybody in Portland is hugging and cuddling and so on. You're arguing a lot. But you're arguing in somehow a productive way that has gotten people into, into public affairs rather than out of public affairs. And, and it seems to us that, that is bound up with somehow a, a city government or a, a, a set of, a structure of government that has somehow not been perfect, of course, but has somehow entered, generated a positive, virtuous circle of responsiveness and engagement that has not happened in the rest of the country. I have to say, because I don't want you to think I'm commenting on contemporary Portland politics, our study, our, those numbers happened to end in 1994. That's just when the data stopped. So I don't know for sure whether this is still true. But no matter whether it's exactly still true, you are way different from the rest of the country. And I talk about this slide actually all over the country. Um, I, I want to just very quickly, well, I, I, actually, Steve, go to the very end, because I'm, I'm I want to just get to the lessons. I'm gonna, I, I, if I had time, I'd tell you about a lot of these other places in New Hampshire, and just keep going. It, uh, it was Craigslist, which is an internet site, keep going. And the public libraries of Chicago, and a uh, youth group in Wapon, Wisconsin, and a uh, neighborhood initiative in Dudley Street in Boston, a great, great neighborhood, a mixed neighborhood there that's done great things, and a tutoring program in Philadelphia, and uh, and a union organizing in, in my own university, actually, Harvard University, which is a very interesting thing. Keep, go to the next, okay, lessons. Here are the lessons, I think. Scale matters. I talked about this in, um, in talking about the, the church. Um, uh, 
for building communities, small is better. Small groups are better. But for the folks in that church don't want to save just a few souls. They want to save every soul in Orange County. And in order to do that, you need these kind of nested uh, structures that I talked about. Um, bonding and bridging. Now, let me pause here because this is the last important point I want to make. I've talked um, all afternoon about social capital as if it were just one thing. Lots of it or little of it. But that's not true. There are different kinds of social capital. And one of the most important differences is between social ties that link you to other people like you, which is typically called bonding social capital, and social ties that link you to people unlike you, which is typically called bridging social capital. My bonding social capital are my ties to other elderly white male professors. My bridging social capital are my ties to people of a different generation or a different gender or a different race or whatever. I'm not saying bridging good, bonding bad. If you get sick, the people who bring you chicken soup are likely to represent your bonding social capital. But I am saying that a society that has only bonding social capital looks like Bosnia or Belfast. That is, tight in the communities not connecting. So if you, we need a lot of bridging, bonding social capital. We also need a lot of bridging social capital. Both in our society, like vitamins, we need a, vitamin A and vitamin B. We need a lot of bonding social capital, uh, bridging social capital, but Bridging social capital is harder to build than bonding social capital. Your grandmother told you that. Your grandmother told you, birds of a feather flock together. What she meant was, bridging social capital is harder to build than bonding social capital. She didn't think you'd understand that, which is why she <laughs> used the avian metaphor. Now, in a diverse society, as our society is becoming more diverse, the kind of social capital we specially need, which is the bridging kind, is a kind that's harder to build. So the prescription, you can go to the very end of the very last slide, Steve, because I would just, that's, I'm now at the very end. Here's the, you, I mean, I'm a professor, right? So you knew there was going to be an assignment. Just go to the, the last right, because I want them to look here. There's an assignment for you. After all, I have uh, easy assignments and tough assignments, and easy assignments I give out elsewhere in the country, but I know that I'm talking to a class of all A students. So I bring you the tough assignment. And your assignment over the next... 10, 15, 20 years, is to figure out how you, because you're already way at the top of the class, how we as a country can invent new forms of bridging social capital in various ways that will weave together the fabric and the tapestry of this nation. You're a terrific audience. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, that was mesmerizing. <clears throat> Absolutely fascinating and good for us in Portland. Uh, we are roughly at the end of our time for the TV broadcast, but what we will do if Professor Putnam's voice holds out, I've, I've got you a new pot of tea there. Oh, great, thank you. Um, we will let Bill Kramer, <clears throat> pardon me, it must be catching. <clears throat> we will let Bill Kramer, who is our board host, ask the first question. Uh -oh. And um, after that, a few questions from the audience, and please keep them really short, because what I would suggest you do if you have questions is to buy Dr. Putnam's book, <laughs> Better Together. That should answer most of them. I'd like to introduce Bill uh, Kramer, who is a, uh, board of, on the Board of Governors, and he is the, um, he's a health care consultant in policy. And um, City Club members only may ask questions. That's just another perk of membership. So buy the book and join City Club. Professor Putnam, you commented on the high level of civic engagement among the generation that was shaped by World War II and the Great Depression, two crises that um, rock, rocked the United States. Recently, our country has faced a similar crisis, the horrific terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on September 11th. Would you comment on our response as a nation and society to the events of September 11th? Sure. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I, we actually know in a systematic way, because my group is, my research group is actually doing, has done a before and after study of social capital in America. We, by, by, I mean, by didn't attend it, but, but before 9-11, we interviewed 30,000 people across America. And then after 9-11, we went back and interviewed some of those same people several different times. So we have a pretty good sense of, but, but the, the, what the, news is, the news is what, what we all know anyhow, which is there was a big spike in community mindedness after 9-11. Um, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that there's a spike like that after every local tragedy, after every flood 
or earthquake or snowstorm, there's a spike. Um, and we know what the half-life is, the how long it lasts. It lasts, you know, a week after a snowstorm or uh, six or 12 months after a, after a hurricane. After the bombing in Oklahoma City, there was a spike in Oklahoma City, and it was gone after about 18, 24 months. Um, there's only one exception that I know of to the generalization that these spikes in community-mindedness go away quickly. And you already know what the exception is. Actually, the only one exception in American history that I know of, and that's the one we talked about, that is Pearl Harbor. The spike after Pearl Harbor never went away. So the challenge that we have faced as a country since 9-11 has been how to make use of that tragedy for reweaving, for re-engaging people. In some sense, I, mean, I don't want to make it sound like I don't think it was a tragedy. Of course it was a tragedy. But it was also the kind of opportunity for civic regeneration that comes along once or twice a century. And the challenge we faced is, could we figure out how to make that momentary tragedy into something positive? And um, I have to say, I don't give us a terribly high grade. The surveys since then have showed dropping uh, engagement. I don't think we've done as good a job of that. Actually, President Bush appointed me to a, a presidential commission. I'm grateful to him for doing that on this question of how to how to re-engage people, and, um, and what I told him is what I will tell you, which is that I think the most important thing is our youth. Um, I'm not just making a generic point about aren't youth important. I'm trying to make the point that if we could begin to build off the um, uh, energy and excitement of our young people, um, that would have a huge long-run effect, just as the effects of the Pearl Harbor on, on that, young, that young generation lasted for you know half a century or more. Um, and there's some evidence that, that might happen. Even before 9-11, there has been an upturn among youth in volunteering. That's not the same as civic engagement. It means, you know, it's helping out in the soup kitchen or whatever. Civic engagement is a little broader than that, trying to figure out why, did, why do we need soup kitchens? I mean, what, is it, what are the social problems that generate homelessness or whatever? And that we're not at yet. I mean, I, the young people are, are still not voting in as great a numbers as, as, as their predecessors did. But I think it's possible that we may be actually, we may be, um, in a sense, because of the creativity of young people and their own idealism, they are, this generation is actually very idealistic, more, old, more idealistic than their immediate predecessors. I'm hoping maybe this election, maybe the Dean phenomenon or the, the fact that, that, I don't mean, I'm not trying to make a partisan point, I hope you understand that, but maybe there is a sense in the country that it's time to get re-engaged with, with uh, pu public life. And if so, we will have uh, gotten something valuable out of the, out of the ashes of 9-11. Thank you. Questions here? Yes, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Ed Press, City Club member. Uh, Professor Putnam, uh, you did an amazing job without a single written note. I congratulate you. you. And I agree with most of the points you made with one exception. Okay. That, that Professor Putnam down. <laughs> right. That exception is social isolation is as bad a risk factor as smoking. What documentation do you have that the mortality rate for social isolation and the mortality rate for smoking is the same. Right, that's a, that's a, good, a good question. Um, the, there has actually been quite a bit of epidemiological evidence on um, the degree to which people who are joiners live longer. And the character of the evidence on that point now is not now as strong as the evidence on smoking is now, but it's about as strong as the evidence on smoking was at the time of the Surgeon General's report. That is, it's not experimental. It's not like we've said to one group of people, you must go to church, and another group of people, you can't go to church. Um, and we, but we do have actually some animal, a, animal analogs, that is, animals who are put in isolation actually do, uh, from one another, I don't mean from us, but from one another, do actually have predictable biochemical reactions that lead to um, a decline in stress buffers in their blood and that is, an, there's analogous evidence on that in the case of humans. Part of the reason, th this area is, area is very well studied, and I, I, I don't want to, and I'm, I'm not actually a medical doctor, but part of the effect here is what's called social support. That is, if you get, if you have lots of friends, and then you, or if you go to church and fall in the tub, uh, if you go to church, and then you fall in the tub, someone will notice. If you, if you get sick some, and you have friends, someone likely to bring you chicken soup. But part of it appears to be not just that social support network. Part of it appears to be physiological. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will readily confess that because this is not yet ex random controlled experiments, we don't yet know for sure which way the cause runs. It's probably not that joiners, or it's not just that joiners are more likely to be, 
I mean, that, that healthy people are more likely to go to clubs is partly, mm -hmm. it looks like there is an effect in the direction that I said. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the reason I use that comparison mm -hmm. is that I want to give some indication of the relative risk size. It, that there, it's a big effect. It's yeah. not a trivial effect. That's no, a good, good point. I know depression is a factor. Absolutely. It, it's just a matter of, of scientific accuracy. Absolutely. And I actually, that's a really, can I just build off the last point you made? I don't know how many people in the room know that we are, as a nation, in the midst of a depression epidemic. The rate, clinically measured rate of depression in America, I don't mean just going to the shrink, the clinically measured rate of depression is increased tenfold over the course of the last generation or two. It's very linked to, to, to um, generation. It's much more concentrated among young people. It's probably causally related to the increase in youth suicide and a major um, factor implicated in depression, I, this is a serious matter. If you know anybody who's suffered from depression, you know that I'm not joking. It's a serious, it's, a, it's not just feeling a little blue. It's a serious disease. And a major risk factor for that is social isolation. So I think there is good evidence that, it's, that this is not just blowing smoke. Yes, sir. I don't know, you can go. She oh. was up there oh, four right. hours. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Elaine Kogan, would you comment on the uh, increase in the use of the internet yes. as bridging and bonding and chat rooms yep. and everything else? Um, several things to say. First of all, the internet and the computer had nothing to do with the onset of this problem. The trends had begun to go down quite a lot, you know, way 20 years before um, the internet had been invented. Bill Gates was in diapers when, when the trends began to go down. So it, it is, is not caught, the internet did not cause this problem. A really different, interesting question is whether the internet will make the problem better or make the problem worse. And the answer to that question is yes. Um, <laughs> Um, there's a lot to be said. There's a lot of really interesting research. I'm, in fact, myself doing some research on that question. And I think, and, and it's not got a simple answer. To some extent, there are users of the Internet that are probably anti-social capital. But the crucial way of framing this issue is to think not in terms of, is there virtual community that is something that's completely in cyberspace versus real community, but to think about possible blends, that is, using Internet technology to strengthen real face-to-face -face connections. And email, for example, is terrifically positive for making connect for, for strengthening and deepening real connections. I mean, my daughter that I mentioned before happens to live in, in uh, Costa Rica, and she and I are in contact all the time, and, and much, much more frequently in contact, or I'm sure much closer, in fact, because of internet, uh, because of the email internet. I did not meet my daughter on the internet. And, <laughs> and, and the point I'm trying to make is, it was I'm using that connection I'm using the real face-to-face -face connection, and I'm ex deep and expanding it with use of technology. And I think that's the key. I think that these meetups that were part of the Dean phenomenon are actually a great example of that, because it's using the technology to try to make connections with people you didn't previously know, but real connections, face-to-face -face connections. I'm optimistic that the internet could be part of the solution, but it won't just automatically happen. I think that, I think actually myself, the virtual community, the idea of these sort of pure you know, chat rooms or whatever, which you don't know the other person, is probably not real social capital. Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. How about over here? You're over here. <laughs> Erwin Mandel, City Club member. As a former statistician, the answers to questions you get statistically depend upon the questions you ask. Sure. So let me suggest two things and your comment on it. As a substitute for eating at home, what about the trend to eating out? Look at the proliferations of restaurants we get where families eat out and couples and uh, friends okay, also eat, go no, to eat out. Is one. All right. The other is perhaps the introduction of Starbucks almost as a European coffee house in right. this country right. where people meet to do business and to interact socially. Right. Um, those are good questions. I actually did in the book, Bowling Alone, actually there's a whole section on eating out and, and Starbucks, actually. Um, <laughs> And I, um, the, 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 I really, the main thing I want to do is to go to the book and see the details because all the numbers are there. But the short answer is um, there has not been an increase in restaurants per capita in America over this period. There's been a decline in restaurants per capita over this period, um, actually a substantial decline. The only exception to that, but it's not enough to make up for everything else, is actually fast food restaurants. That is where you don't, where you, you know, McDonald's or whatever. And I just can't believe, I, just, I actually went and hung out in some McDonald's. I'm, you know, I'm even eating McDonald's, but, and I'm not making a point about the cuisine. I'm saying that's not a place where people are having warm, long, cuddly, heart-to-heart -heart conversations. They're grabbing their meals and going. And, and so the fast food, even if you counted the fast food as the equivalent of the family dinner, it's not enough to make up for the decline in mm -hmm. restaurants and so on, and the decline in bars and in diners 
is way bigger than the increase in uh, coffee houses nationwide. It is true that, that you can, in the data, you can see it in Bowling Alone, there is an increase in coffee houses, but it's dwarfed by these, these other trends. So I don't think I've, when I did Bowling Alone, I first of all published an article in which I showed some of these lines, and, and people said, I, there was a standard response, I bet Putnam has forgotten about X. I bet Putnam has forgotten about coffee houses. I bet he's forgotten about eating out. I bet he's forgotten about soccer leagues. I bet he's forgotten about uh, prayer groups. I bet he's forgotten about um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I spent the next five years checking all those things out, and I am now the country's leading expert on soccer moms. I can tell you just exactly what the trends are. And the, the short answer is, when you take all those things into account, the problem is actually worse than I had thought. We, when you take, there are some things going up, but they're, but, but they're way swamped by the things that are going down. Yes, ma'am. Last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Putnam, for coming and your two books. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us or, or suggest ways that we can uh, deal with bowling alone and the implications and how to engage, uh, how to, how to en really engage people in, in in doing what you're just talking about in the second book. Right. Um, that's a terrifically good question. Um, there are some things that we can do in a way one-on-one -on -one or, or from the grassroots up. And that's, there are a lot of suggestions, a lot of suggestions in, Bol in uh, Better Together. Um, I think actually more picnics would be a terrifically good idea. And the reason I use a, lo a lot of what you can see I'm doing is trying to get people to say, well, you know, actually maybe I should go on a picnic. Uh, just for the fun of it, and, 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 and also I'll live longer, and all those great things will, and all the pr primaries will fall, and miraculous things will happen. I mean, it cures almost everything you can think of. I'm, uh, so partly I'm trying to say, do it. Do pick, cut, pick up a phone and call somebody and have dinner together, or, or, or have a potluck or whatever in the neighborhood. That kind of thing at the grassroots works. But I also want to say it's not only those kinds of immediate circle things. It's also the, we need to have changes in public policy. Sprawl actually is a deterrent to civic engagement, and we can think about that. You've actually done something about that, and I, and I know it's complicated, but I also think maybe the Urban Growth Roundry and, and, and your special planning in, in Oregon may be one of the reasons why you've had this better, better together thing. Um, so we, and sprawl is relevant. Um, there are things we can do in our schools, lots of things we can do in our schools, lots that, that need to be done. More civics education, more extracurricular activities, more focus on, on, on getting kids involved, not teaching them that there are two houses to, in Congress, but about how to get involved in community affairs. Big things can be done there. Uh, and finally, the workplace, actually. I think um, we've had a huge change in the workplace in my adult lifetime, big change. Um, over the, during the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution meant a third of all Americans moving from fields to factories. That was it. That was the Industrial Revolution. In our lifetime, roughly a third of Americans have moved from kitchens to offices. Well, we've done nothing to accommodate that in terms of our, the structure of the, I'm not only talking about families, I mean the structure of our society is still built in a society in which everybody had a wife at home. Now almost nobody has a wife at home to worry about family and community affairs. And another way to put that is, I, I hope this doesn't sound like I'm blaming women, I'm not blaming women at all. I'm saying the society has not adapted to the fact that we, now all of us assume that both people are, both adults are gonna be working outside the home. And therefore all of the costs of that change, we've, we've downsized tremendously the caregiving side of our, it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the statistics, right, because it was just mom taking care of the kids, we, but we have in fact downsized the caregiving part of our economy enormously. I'm not suggesting that we should, all women should go back to the kitchen, but I am suggesting that in the structure of our labor law and the structure of the practices in the workplace, we've got to stop putting all of the costs of that transformation onto families and communities and think about how the employers can take part in producing this public good, which is the, the social capital. Well, I actually have six other key solutions, but we run out of time. Um, <laughs> buy the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, let's do some more bonding by joining up to City Club, and then we'll do some bridging as well. Thanks for your attendance. See you, Governor at the Governor.